We would like to welcome you to our new series on the book of Daniel, where God reveals the future history of mankind. Now, Daniel tells us we are in the last moments of human history and concludes with God's redemption of mankind. We invite you to stay with us. We know you will be blessed. I'm reminded of how much I need to know You are for me, you're not against me You are with me, I'm not alone Through all the darkest times and brightest days I know some things will always stay the same I'm not alone Well, it's good to be back with you. Thank you for having us in your home for the next few minutes. We hope that you'd have some wonderful discoveries. We are in the book of Daniel, and these are the historical parts of Daniel. So we just pray that you would have a really great uh, time just listening to the story. But may the principles in this story speak to us as well today. So I want to go to the picture Sherry has brought to us today. It's the north coast of California here on the west coast, the Pacific Ocean. And in that beautiful stack that you see there on your screen, just to the left, over almost to the edge of your screen, that there is a little family standing together as those waves are breaking over them. See, this happens to be a morning in the summertime. And, uh, you know, that's cold water, but uh, folks just love to go out there and have those waves break. I mean, there's a lot of power in that ocean. So I hope you enjoy this little story this morning. Thank you, Sherry, for bringing it to us. Now we want to jump into our study in Daniel chapter 5. Faith and Hope for Today is our series, The Handwriting on the Wall. Now in this story, remember just one theme in this entire portion of the book of Daniel, chapters 1 through 6. Daniel's name in Hebrew is, God is my judge. So every time you hear that name, it is a proclamation that God is my judge. And when you say that, then you understand that God is also your judge. And I, I hope that really sets us free from having to judge others. But I hope you have an encounter with Daniel and his God today in chapter 5. So the dreams of Nebuchadnezzar that were interpreted in chapters 2 and 3 are being fulfilled. So once again, Daniel finds himself as God's man for the hour, right in the middle of the drama in the palace. Now, remember his name, God is my judge, is now fulfilling what that name means. In other words, it is the simple, clear theme of the book of Daniel. So let's see the implications of that as we jump into our story today. So this is Daniel 5, this is verse 1, it begins, Belshazzar the king held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles. Now, I want you to understand that Belshazzar is the son of Nebuchadnezzar. He is now the king. He is throwing a party for 1,000 of his nobles. And it's a real party. They're drinking wine in the presence of thousands. This is going to get a little bit wild here. Verse 2, Then Belshazzar tasted the wine. When he did, he gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels, which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives and concubines, might drink from them, might get drunk from them, using them. Now, what about these utensils? They came from the temple in Jerusalem. These are the sacred vessels used in the ordinances in the house of God. And Belshazzar, who wasn't really connected to the value. Nebuchadnezzar put those in the treasury in his temple, not to be used, but more or less as trophies, if you would, for the conquering king. 
But notice his son decided to use them for a big party to get drunk, which would essentially be blasphemy. Verse 3, Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles and his wives and his concubines drank from them. Verse 4, they drank the wine, but now listen carefully, and praised the gods of gold, silver, bronze, and iron, wood, and stone, which were their gods that they imagined and made up as real gods. We call them idols, if you would. They're using the sacred vessels from the house of God to worship idols. Now, you can't really get more blasphemous than that. Now remember Daniel's name. God is my judge. Let's continue the story. Suddenly the fingers of a man's hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstands, the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw the back of a hand that did the writing. Now let's imagine that if you have a thousand guests in this hall, this is a huge wall. And so everyone in this room can see this mysterious hand it is large enough and writing big enough letters on the wall that 1,000 guests and the king and his wives and concubines can see. And this finger makes the letters and leaves them remaining, maybe glowing on the wall. Now, what would your response be if a mysterious hand suddenly appeared and started writing things on the wall. Would you be just a little bit taken back from that? It says in verse 6, And the king's face grew pale, his thoughts alarmed him, his hip joints went slack, and his knees began knocking together. Now, you know, I, I remember in high school they often talked about when we did speech class how your knees would knock. Uh, I just want you to know that this has been a human problem for centuries. And Belshazzar here is having a terrifying moment. What could this mean? What on earth could this mean? Verse 7, The king called aloud to bring in the conjurers, the Chaldeans, the diviners. The king spoke and said to the wise men of Babylon, Any man who can read this inscription and explain its interpretation to me shall be clothed with purple and have a necklace of gold around his neck and have authority as third ruler in the kingdom. Now, I'm going to tell you, in this kingdom, that's a lot of power and a lot of authority and a lot of wealth because those garments had political implications. That gold had authority and implications that went with it. And the title had serious implications of authority. So anyone who could give the correct interpretation would become the third most powerful person in this nation. That is really an invitation to rise to the occasion, isn't it? So in verse 8 we read, Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the inscription or make known its interpretation to the king. So I'm going to venture to say it was most likely written in Hebrew because they did not speak or read Hebrew. And in verse 9 it says, Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed, his face grew even paler, and his nobles were perplexed. So just think about how God is approaching this message now to Belshazzar. He wants to convey something profoundly significant to him. And he does it through this hand floating in the air, writing this message on the wall. And it's getting through. Everyone in that room is, I believe, in a temporary moment of paralysis looking at that wall. And, and their minds are just frozen. They are perplexed is how Daniel recorded it. Then the queen entered the banquet hall because of the words of the king and his nobles. 
And she spoke. Here's what she said. O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts alarm you or your face be pale. So she's reading the situation correctly, isn't she? She is fully aware of the alarming moment this is for this young man who is now king over this nation. But she has good news. There is a man in your kingdom in whom a spirit of the holy gods and in the days of your father, illumination. Now, please make note of this list. Illumination, insight, and wisdom. Like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. Now, we talked about spiritual gifts earlier. How God gifted Daniel wisdom and his friends wisdom. But... More than that, Daniel was given the ability of interpretations of dreams and visions. But I want you to look now as we are reaching the elder years of Daniel, and I want you to notice how this spiritual gift is manifested in this story. And King Nebuchadnezzar, she continues, your father, your father the king appointed him chief of the magicians, conjurers, Chaldeans, and diviners. Now, just pause for a moment here. <clears throat> here, Daniel, <clears throat> with this spiritual gift, is able to rise to this position as a young man. Now, we come to this national crisis. And God is my judge is now brought back into the story. Let's, let's look at it carefully. This was because... An extraordinary spirit, knowledge and insight, interpretation of dreams, explanation of enigmas, and solving of difficult problems were found in this man, God is my judge, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Let Daniel now be summoned, and he will declare the interpretation. So Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Are you that God is my judge who is one of the exiles from Judah whom my father the king brought from Judah? Now keep in mind that this young man grew up in the palace. He probably knew Daniel when he was younger. But there is such a disconnect between this young man and his father and his father's administration. And, and I want you to pay attention to that. I think it's an important observation. In verse 14 it reads, Now I have heard about you, that a spirit of the gods is in you, that illumination, insight, and extraordinary wisdom have been found in you. Just now, the wise men and the conjurers were brought in before me that they might read this inscription and make its interpretation known to me. But they could not declare the interpretation of the message. So, just look at the story for a moment. Nobody else in this entire kingdom, except God's man for the hour, could resolve this conflict for Belshazzar. But I also want you to remember the context of the story. This is a drunken party. It is taking the sacred vessels that God had made for the worship of the temple in Jerusalem. They're being used in this worship of pagan kings and praise of pagan gods made of stone and wood and metal. And the wisest men of the nation were stumped. They couldn't figure out anything. Notice verse 16. But I have personally heard about you that you are able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. So if you are able to read the inscription and make its interpretation known to me, you will be clothed with purple and wear a necklace of gold around your neck and you will have authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. How do you identify with this story? 
Well, I suppose that you could look at it this way. Suppose the President of the United States called you up and said, if you could solve this problem for the entire nation, we would make you the third most, would make you third in line for the throne, for the presidency. How would you respond to that? What would be going through your mind personally? And as you challenge yourself with that thought, then we need to see how Daniel responded to that. So here it is in verse 17. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Keep your gifts for yourself, or give your rewards to someone else. However, I will read the inscription to the king and make the interpretation known to him. Now, this is one of these moments in the book of Daniel in which you recognize where the servants of God have the ability in the simplest way to express humility. You see, to Daniel it's not about power, it's not about authority, it's not about wealth. To Daniel, he says, I am here for God. And God is my judge, is going to make an interpretation, and he is going to reveal this to you. And he continues, verse 18. O king, the most high God, granted sovereignty, grandeur, glory, and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar, your father. Now, this is really, really important because this young whips whippersnapper, this young king, is going to get a brief history lesson. A very, very important history lesson. Listen to the principles that are laid out to him. Verse 19, because of the grandeur which he bestowed on him, all the peoples and nations and men of every language feared and trembled before him Whomever he wished he killed, whomever he wished he spared alive, whomever he wished he elevated, and whomever he wished he humbled. So Daniel makes no qualms about the incredible authority and power that King Nebuchadnezzar had over his kingdom. But listen to the contrast. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit became so proud that he behaved arrogantly, he was deposed from his royal throne and his glory was taken away from him. Now, what, what do you think God is trying to say to Belshazzar here? Belshazzar, the king who's having this drunken party with a thousand of his lords, God is speaking to him through God is my judge, Daniel. And he's conveying this message to him that is profoundly significant, that is registering in his mind. He was also, Daniel continues, driven away from mankind, and his heart was made like that of a beast, and his dwelling place was with the wild donkeys. He was given grass to eat like cattle, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he recognized that the Most High God is ruler over the realm of mankind, and he sets over it whomever he wishes. Some translations would say that God sets up kings and takes them down. Is that still true today? Is it possible that in this crazy world, God allows individual leaders to be put in place that they may affect the world for the better, just like Nebuchadnezzar, that they can make it a safer, healthier place for every human being. And may I just take it a step further? As Paul would say, they're held to a higher level of accountability. They have a more serious judgment to face because of the responsibility they have. God sets up kings and takes them down. That is an important point in this story. Now notice verse 22. Yet you, his son Belshazzar, 
have not humbled your heart even though you knew all of this. Did you catch that? Belshazzar knew all of this already. This was his own history. Isn't it interesting how sometimes our own arrogance can make us forget our own history and the important lessons we needed to learn from where we came from? I have two thoughts here. One is, Everyone does what they do because they gain a benefit from it. So Belshazzar is gaining a benefit from this party he's throwing. He's gaining a benefit from taking the sacred vessels and using them for a drunken party. But someone else said it this way, that in your family you're giving blessings and curses. And that as we mature and, and grow up as adults, that we get the choice every day to carry on the curses or to allow the blessings to take root and grow us into the men and women we're called to be. Where is Belshazzar in this experience? He's arrogant. He thinks he's something. Maybe one of the most dangerous positions a human being can be in. And he failed to value his history and to learn from it. Can you draw a lesson from this for yourself personally? Verse 23, but you have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your nobles, your wives, your concubines have been drinking wine from them. Now they're indicted by the man whose name is God is my judge. And you have praised the gods of silver, gold, bronze, iron, and wood, and stone, which do not see, hear, or understand, but the God in whose hand are your life and breath and all your ways you have not glorified. Makes you wonder if there was a sense of reverence and acknowledgement of God if this story might have had a different outcome, doesn't it? In verse 24, then the hand was sent from him, and this inscription was written out. Now this is the inscription that was written out, many, many tekel yefarsin. Those are the letters still glowing on that wall, written by the invisible hand. This is the interpretation of the message. Now, I hope you have the whole story in your mind. What Belshazzar is just doing, what he has accomplished in his just totally ignoring the importance of God, the message interpreted reads like this, many, God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. Now, wait a minute. Put an end to it? You mean it's over? Belshazzar just received information that God has judged him. And the message is being conveyed by a man whose name is God is my judge. And he has now just imposed on Belshazzar that God is his judge as well. Tikal, you have been weighed in the scales and found deficient. You've come up short. Now, in the New Testament, harmartia is the word for sin, which means you have missed the mark. You have come up short of putting your arrow directly in the center of the target. In this word, it implies Belshazzar, you have come up short. You've been found efficient. You have missed the mark. Your sin has caught up to you. I hope you're paying attention to this. Perez, or Eupharsin would be the word Perez. Your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and Persians. Now, if you're the king and you're sitting there having this grand party, what would you be saying, oh man, this guy is just like off 
He, he's not even close to being right. We're having a great time in my kingdom. Pay attention, verse 29. Then Belshazzar gave orders. They clothed Daniel with purple and put a necklace of gold around his neck, issued a proclamation concerning him that he now had authority as the third ruler of the kingdom. Verse 30. That same night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was slain. The artist conveys the Medes and Persians walking through the gates of Babylon here. It's just a really remarkable piece of art because he has truly and accurately captured the blue tiles and the animals that are in the reliefs of those walls. Parts of those walls of Babylon are actually in one of the museums in England. You can actually go there and see some of this handiwork of ancient Babylon. So the picture you're looking at is a correct interpretation from the artist of what those gates of that city actually looked like. So Darius the Mede received the kingdom at about the age of 62. So Daniel once again verifies that God, the creator of the universe, has spoken the future and it has been fulfilled as he said it would. That is such incredible good news. That, that the God of the universe is able to fully identify with Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar and Daniel. Can you understand that the God of the universe can fully identify with you and with me in our daily lives and know what is coming around the corner? And what does he ask? Have we humbly accepted that we are dependent upon him by faith alone, and that the praise and the honor and the glory of those things in our life are deserving to God. Not to our jobs, not to our belongings, not to our possessions, but to God himself. I want to take just a moment and go to our picture, this last one of the slides that we want to see this morning. And I watch, I mean, this is just one of those big waves that comes crashing in and, and Sherry's out here standing on this rock and the, this wave is washing over the rock. She's having a great time out there. But it, it just shows you that incredible power of the ocean to come in and reshape those beaches and that sand over and over and over. Are you allowing God to have dominion in your kingdom? Do you give him honor, glory, and praise? Because God is my judge and yours too. Blessings now. Thanks for listening. I hope you have an awesome rest of your day. Thank you for watching today. Our email address is screamingrockministries at gmail.com or drop us a note to Screaming Rock Ministries, P.O. Box 5622, Twin Falls, Idaho 83303.